All right, good evening, Matt. It's good time evening, for us, brother. It's time for us uh, to get started. I. It is cold outside. It is. It's a little drizzly. They say snow's coming, but I don't believe it. Eh, probably not. Although, you know, the five years ago, me would have laughed at the thought that what's outside now would be cold. Right. Because, you know, it, it, your nose hairs were still unfrozen out there, so it's, it's not that bad yet. Well, I, I, I tell you what, even though it is cold outside, thank you all for joining us. I'm looking, Matt. We got, we got a pretty good turnout tonight. Excellent. Let us know if you're. Let us know if you're watching. <laughs> tell us if you're watching. Uh, if you're not one of the members here at the congregation, please tell us where you're watching from. I love to find out where people are reviewing in from. Yeah, it's always interesting to find out where this stuff makes its way to. It does. It does. I'll be I'll be monitoring the uh, comment thread on Facebook. So if you have a question or a comment during our discussion, throw it in there. Uh, maybe about the time of our first break, we'll come in and do everyone's favorite roll call. I do have to say tonight, though, if you if you are texting me, I know because I get people that text me, I, I may not get it. Um, if you got an iPhone, I think I will, but if you're using an Android, I probably won't. I I, I got the new I got the new phone, yeah. so I don't have a SIM card in this one, ah. but. Uh, because all the Apple stuff's connected. If you're using an iPhone, it should come through. But Androids, I am sorry. Oh, so that this is like iPhone bigotry then? That, yeah, that's right. If, if, <laughs> it'll actually show up on that one, but I won't be able to read that one. So anyway, there we go. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at Esther chapters 7, 8, 9, and then the few little verses that compose chapter yes. 10. Uh, got, got to be one of the shortest chapters in the Bible. I think so. Uh, probably one of the Psalms might come in at two verses. Yeah. Wait, which one is it? I don't remember. Just make one up. <laughs> I, I, I know I paraphrased it recently. I know yeah. it's there. It's in the 100s. There we go. Okay, Matt, bring us up to 117? speed. 117. Matt says it's 117. What is the shortest chapter in the Bible? Matt will give a prize to whomever. You keep on promising prizes. Yeah. It and, is 117, so no prize for anybody oh, but me. Oh. Okay. Also, Matt put this challenge out Sunday. If you can if you can figure out the connection between Acts 8 and the epistle to James, put it in the comment section. First one that does that, except for Ashley Barnett, gets a prize. Matt will give you a prize. I heard, I heard somebody say that. Well, I guess I need to stop by the dollar store on the way home. <laughs> okay, Matt, bring us up to speed, and then y'all let me know who's watching, and we'll do the roll call after that. Go ahead, Matt. Well, what we've got in uh, Esther up to this point is, you remember that Esther becomes queen, Mordecai offends Haman, Haman mm -hmm. decides he uh, needs to exterminate the Jewish race, uh, Mordecai sort of nudges Esther into going before the king. Yeah, that's in chapter four. Yep. And then the, there's this odd little event where Haman comes into the king, meaning to ask him to kill Mordecai, and he ends up honoring Mordecai instead. Right. And now in chapter seven, we have arrived at banquet number two. Okay. So Esther's plan to upset Haman's plan is to have a feast because the book of Esther is all about feasting. So she calls King and Haman to come to the feast. The king says, hey, whatever you want up to half the kingdom, I'll give it to you. And so she says, we'll come back tomorrow for supper. And there, now we're going to pick up in chapter 7 with this second feast that Haman has been brought to, rather upset because of the events of chapter 6. Right. And uh, now the plot, uh, Haman's plot, is going to be revealed. So the first question for us to look at, and it's an extended question, Esther up until this point has been rather passive. Right. It's not until she's prodded by Mordecai at the end of chapter four that she becomes more assertive and proactive. So how do we see her character develop throughout chapter seven, eight, and nine? We stop at nine because she's not mentioned in 10. Correct. So how do we see her developing in seven, eight, and nine? And what do you want to talk about chapter seven? But before you do that, let's do roll call. You ready? You ready? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Chris and Debbie are watching, and Debbie is watching, and Lynn is watching, and Tammy Nicholson and family are watching, and Carolyn says hi. 
Excellent. And I Lauren is watching, and she says, hi, everybody. And let's see, uh, uh, Barbara Latimus is watching, and Nelda Nichols is watching, and Judy is watching, and Shirley Fox is watching, and uh, uh, the Smith family is watching, and Ashley's watching, and the both of us are watching, and Caitlin both of us says to say she is watching as well. And hey, uh, let's see, oh, Chris Barnett's watching. He's doing double watching. Yeah, he he's watching yeah, us live. See, and, yeah, seeing us live is just not enough. So he has to have us on this. Uh, I, I'm not sure about two mats and two clays. That yeah. might be a bit much, but <laughs> apparently that's where he is. Uh, actually, and uh, Sandra and Bradley are watching, and Judy's watching, and uh, good old Janie is uh, over there on Merlin Court watching. Excellent as well. I dropped my paper. Okay, Matt, get us up to speed on Esther chapter seven. Well, this is the moment where uh, Haman finds out how all of his worst nightmares are going to come true. That's right. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? <laughs> so hey, you, you've got the banquet. Mm -hmm. And then we see uh, Esther really completing her transition into a polished sort of courtier politician type. Right. Uh, that, but I, I think the way that she puts it in verses three and four is hilarious. Yeah, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if the king is pleased, spare my life. This is my request. And spare my people. This is my desire. For my people and I have been sold to destruction, death, and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would, slaves, I would have kept silence. Indeed, mm -hmm. the trouble wouldn't be worth burdening the king. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, she is laying it on with a trowel. Yes. She is definitely laying on thing. I mean, basically, just listen to what she is saying. You know what? If you just sold us off like a bunch of cattle, I wouldn't. I wouldn't that, have any that, problem. That would have been fine. That wouldn't have been worth bothering you. Yes, with yes, yes. But but somebody wants to kill me, and all my people, and uh, and so she she does lay it on thick. Well, then the king comes in. Well, who is he? Where is he? Who has dared to do this? Let me add him. Let me add him. Yeah, let me add him. And uh, and so verse six, a foe and an enemy. Of course, she's she's pointing at him. This wicked Haman. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, Haman feels a little bit unsteady on his feet. Yeah, the, the, the world has shifted in an unpleasant way. Yeah. So here is a, here's a, a woman who went along with the scheme not to identify her nationality or ethnicity or her religious affiliation. And Haman has zero idea. And he has zero idea. The king has zero idea. But she has no problem pointing the finger and identifying the, the real enemy in the room yes. uh, as she does it with him in a very dramatic way. Uh, even though, of course, uh, everyone involved knows perfectly well that the king signed off on this whole thing. Right, right. But we're not going to talk about that part. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's just get to, to the mastermind behind it all. Well, the king in his fury... Uh, rose from his wine drinking. This is verse seven. And he went into the palace garden so he could get some fresh air. But Haman stayed to beg for his life for Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. You can see the look on his face. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine and Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And um, the king didn't like that all that much, did he? Hey, the, let, let's just say he misconstrued it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that, that's, that's an interesting point to make here. Haman wants to kill the Jews because a Jew will not fall down before him. Haman then falls down at the feet of a Jewess. And then this action is taken in a bad way. Well, he thinks he is going to sexually assault her. Yeah. Or, and if if you remember, over the past couple of weeks, we've talked about how it seems like Haman is interested in uh, edging his way into all of these trappings of royalty. Right, right. You know, if he's got the royal horse and the royal robe, then the only thing that's left is the royal woman. That's right. And so, and so here he is, the king thinks, after the royal woman. Yep. And so the king sees it and he says, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? And as the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. <laughs> I just have to think for just a moment. Is there a guard standing by with, with a hood? 
I mean, is that is that was that just like normal things that guards kept on on person uh, in, the, in the court of the king of kings? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. So uh, here he, he, you know, he he takes the hood out from underneath his belt and puts it on him. And then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in the attendant, said, hey, "You know those gallows Haman had prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king, are <laughs> standing. Let's go hang him." Yeah, the, you know it's funny. We think of this as like this, you know, little little private, intimate dinner, just the three yeah, of them. Yeah. But really, there are all of these people standing around. Yep. And one of them is this eunuch named Harbona, and he is really evidently not a friend of Haman. No. Because not not only does Haman want to kill the kill the the queen. Yes. He also wants to kill Mordecai, who saved the king. Yeah. So you know, if the the enemy of the, the enemy is your friend. Yep then the enemy of your friend is your enemy. That's right. So uh, string him high, hang him on that. And so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king felt a whole lot better. <laughs> yeah. yeah he, he, he looks up at the corpse and, whew, yeah, that's a relief. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, now I can get back to drinking. I need, we, we need to stop here for just a moment. Somebody has joined us that I am so glad. They, I, have, I haven't got to see their name in a while. I haven't got to talk to them. But Drury has joined us. Oh, hey, Drury. Hey, buddy. I am so glad you're watching us tonight. I hope that you're doing well. And uh, we, we, we need to catch up here uh, real soon. So thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, let's see. <laughs> Dave, uh, Dave has weighed in and said, not just standing, but standing at Haman's house. Yeah, the, the gallows are not just already erected. Yes. They're at his house. So yes. let's go over there and hang him high there. Yes. So, so Haman has a new lawn ornament and he's it. That's right. That's right. All right. So that gets us then to, uh, well, to go back to my question, how do, how do we see her developing? Well, in chapter seven, she is at her most assertive. I, I think so. And, and then in chapter eight, which we'll get to in just a moment, uh, we see her willing to risk her life again. Yes. And taking charge as part of um, this uh, this royal decree to, yes, to the, save the, the, the Jews. The anti-extermination campaign. That's right. And, uh, and then we see her in chapter 9 asking for more time to kill more enemies. So, you know, she is developing all the way through. Yes. And uh, so she's gone from this passive person to this very assertive person. Somebody's going to not like me for saying this, but but almost vengeful person. You know, can we have another day to kill our enemies, please? We, we, we didn't have enough time. Yeah. There, there are still some who survived. That's right. So we, we want to wipe them out too. So uh, so there. Uh, Carolyn weighs in and says Esther goes from being a pawn to a family, national, and religious leader, and I think that's certainly there. And we'll we'll get to that latter part here in, in as we get to Purim. Um, okay. Chapter 8, Matt. Chapter 8 is an unusual event because I think if we start reading it just right away, we might miss the time frame here. Because it starts out by saying, On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told him uh, he what, what he was to her. And the king took off the signet ring, which he had taken from Haman and given it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai all over all the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this is our, our favorite whipping boy. And yeah. But we, we hate to uh, criticize the chapter breaks. But, right. But really, we don't hate to criticize the chapter That's breaks. That's right. And, and this is another bad one. Yeah, at least, at least in the English standard, we get a new paragraph beginning with verse 3. This is almost three months later. Uh, in fact, if we keep reading... Um, glance at verse 9. Is it verse 9? Yeah, there we go. At verse 9, we actually get the timestamp. Yep. So the event starting at verse 3 um, is in the third month, where all the other events were in the first month. So we're almost two months later. I said three. We're almost two months after the event. What is she doing or having to do two months later? Well, the, the issue is you know, Haman is dead. Right. Uh, although, interestingly, at this point, his, his, his sons are still alive. Right. And uh, the decree that he convinced Ahasuerus to issue against the Jews is still in force, even though he himself no longer is. That's right. So, so something to think about here as you look at verse 3. At that first banquet, she, 
she saved herself and presumably she saved her people in that they were all identified with her. Right. But nothing had actually been done about it. No. And, and so two months later, we have to go through this all over again. So according to verse three, then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agite, and the plot that had been devised against the Jews. And when the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And so she says, and she makes basically the same plea, yeah. if it please the king, and if I have found favor in your sight, and if this thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, and then lays it all out there again. And exact I, same formula. I, I think that's something that's funny here, though, is if we look back at, was it chapter 4, chapter 5, where uh, Esther shows up? Mm-hmm. Uh, in, I guess, chapter 5 is actually when she approaches the king. Right. Uh, in verse 2 of chapter 5, as soon as the king saw Queen Esther standing in the courtyard, she gained favor with him, and he extends the, the golden scepter, and then she comes forward. But in chapter 8, she walks all the way in, and she's like down and groveling right, before right. he finally extends he's the scepter. So, okay. yeah. so, so he's like sitting on his throne, and he's looking at, well, I, I'm not sure yet. Let, let me listen. Oh, okay, okay, you get to list. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it, you know, if, if we're too quick to kind of read through all this, we miss these little odds and ends details. But she's having to risk her life all over again. And, and this one seems closer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that one always gets the impression that if she had been groveling for the wrong cause, then this wouldn't have gone as well. Right, right. You know, in that first instance, when she goes before the king, it's almost like, oh, there's Esther. I haven't seen her in a while. Come here, babe. How you doing? Where in this one, she's having to nag him a little bit yeah. to get him to do what she wants, at least recognize her. So, and, so and it, of course, none of this had occurred to the king himself. Right. That he, he was you know, just copacetic with leaving that, that statute in force. Right. So she comes before the king in order to get him to allow them to write a new edict. Right. Now, you can't rever reverse the law of the Medes and the Persians. What's written is written. So Mordecai then comes up with another edict. And so, so kind of help, help us pull out the high points of this edict that Mordecai issues. Uh, basically... Uh, the way that this one works is, whereas before the enemies just had permission to go and slaughter the Jews, mm -hmm. now the Jews have the right to defend themselves and kill their enemies and take their stuff. Okay. Let's see, where, where does the edict pick up? Uh, uh, verse 11. Verse 11, there we go. Chapter 8, uh, verse 11. Just read for us the edict real quick. It says, the king's edict gave, to the, gave the Jews in each and every city. This has gone out to all... 127 provinces, mm -hmm. uh, the right to assemble and defend themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate, yes. and, and hurt, and make uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> uh, We've got to cover all of our bases. Yes. Uh, every ethnic and provincial army hostile to them, including women and children. I'm not sure what the, the wives and kids are doing in the army. Right. Uh, and to take their possessions as spoils of war. And this would take out or take place on a single day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month Adar. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, the Persian post, beginning with verse 13, goes out and does their job. Now, what is, what is really unique then about what Mordecai does here with this edict? It is, uh, the, the other one is still in force. Right. So these people have been authorized to kill the Jews, but now the Jews are authorized to kill them. That's right. So basically, we, since we can't undo a law, we've written a companion law that basically outdoes it. It, it would be like if there had been and a law to, to raise taxes. Now, now the new law is that if the taxman comes and gets money from you, then you can hit him over the head and take part of it back. Sure. <laughs> Look at verse 15. So then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in the royal robes of blue and white and great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And every province and every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear the Jews had fallen on them. <laughs> after, after Haman's edict, 
there's confusion, there's fasting, there's weeping, there's all kinds of distress. After Mordecai's edict, there's gladness and joy, not just from the Jews, but from everybody. Yeah. And everybody wants to be a Jew. Yes. Uh, although some of the people who become Jews, it seems like they are concerned that they might end up on the Jews' enemies list. Right, right. And the quickest way to get off the enemies list is to become Jews themselves. Yep. So we see them doing that. So we have the complete opposite of, of Haman's. Okay, let's move to chapter 9. We're, let's see, we're in the third month. Now we flash forward to the twelfth month. So three quarters of the year later, at the end of the year, the Jews have it out with their enemies. Kind of explain what goes on here in verses 1 through 19. Uh, basically what goes on is uh, you have the, the Jews assembling according to the edict. Okay. Mordecai gets famouser and famouser. And is that a real word? It is now. Okay. Uh, the Jews do exactly what the edict commands them to. They start uh, slaughtering uh, all of their enemies, including the names of these guys that I'm mostly not going to... Uh, uh, although I, I, I do know a woman named Adalia, so... Okay. Uh, but, but this is apparently a, a man here. Uh, all of these polysyllabic sons of Haman. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm kind of Indian, actually. It does. Uh, and so, so they kill all of their enemies, including the ten sons of Haman, but they don't take any of the plunder. Now, that last line, they don't take any of the plunder, what's the significance of that? First, do, it, first do give me the textual significance. Uh, the textual significance is that they were allowed to do it. Okay, they were they allowed. they had permission to do it. That's right, they but they didn't. didn't. Go back to Haman's edict. He was going to plunder the Jews' goods in order to pay the king off. For destroying them. Right. So Haman was going to plunder them. Mordecai said, Mor I'm sorry, Haman was going to plunder the Jews. Mordecai said, you can plunder your enemies, but the Jews lay no hand on the plunder whatsoever. Why, why do you think they did that? Uh, I think that the significance of this gets back to that, that weird uh, 1 Samuel theme. It's 1 mm -hmm. Samuel 15 that has been lingering all the way through the book. Because if right. you recall, a few weeks ago, we talked about how uh, Haman was the Ag Agagite, uh, like Agag, the king of the Amalekites, who is the, the great enemy of Saul. Mm -hmm. And Mordecai has all of these Benjamite surnames in his lineage. Right. You know, he is descended from somebody named Kish, just like Saul was. And so we have kind of a, a clue that these people are going to be enemies. But if you go back to 1 Samuel 15, then the issue there is Saul is told to go destroy the Amalekites, but A, he spares Agag, mm -hmm. and B, he spares the best of the flocks and the herds. Mm -hmm. So the implication is that these Jews are behaving more righteously with the opportunity that God has given them than Saul and the people did back in 1 Samuel 15. That's right. Now, unless I've missed it, is there any language in chapter 9 to suggest that the Jews were attacked by their enemies? Uh, there is not. In fact, I think if we look at verse 2, not a single per person could withstand them. Fear of them fell on every nationality. So you've got a bunch of enemies of the Jews who are uh, cowering in their homes, mm -hmm. and then comes the knock at the door and... Uh, in come the Jews with their swords and they murder their enemies. It does read that way. There's one, if, if um, let's see, there was one phrase in here where it says, I, I thought it said they, they gather to defend themselves. I thought I just saw it. See, this is where we need a live audience. You know, we actually have an audience. What do y'all see? When you read verses 1 through 19, do you see the Jews striking out against their enemies, or do you see the enemies attacking the Jews? Because Mordecai's edict said, defend yourselves if they attack you, but it never said, go out and destroy your enemies. And, and although at that point, the reaction of all the people who become Jews because they're scared makes mm -hmm. a lot more sense. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? So, so as we read verses 1 through 19... 
I mean, they killed up to 75,000 people. Yeah. Uh, verse 16, the rest of the Jews who are in the king's provinces also get, oh, there it is, also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. So there's our no, no plunder again. Yes, uh, and it's telling that it is emphasized twice. Right. But, you know, and, and, one wonders, too, if this is just sort of a preemptive defense. Right, okay. And so, so the, uh, the both the household says, look at verse 2, the Jews gathered in their cities throughout all providences to lay hand on those who sought their harm. So maybe this is a preemptive attack in defense, like you say. Yeah, well, the, the other edict is still in force. So That's right. Some wise guy might get the idea to go try it. It but. is an absolute bloodbath. Absolutely. And in fact, the king is astonished that they killed so many people. Um, let's see. It's reported to the king that they have killed 500 people in Susa. Uh, the king says to queen, verse 12, In Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? So what do you want me to do? What's uh, your wish? 500 times yeah. uh, 127. Yeah. And so, in fact, you know what? When you read that, what is your wish? So she's come to him a third time. Yeah. What is it that you want? And, uh, and so they want to kill more people. Yeah. And no, this time, though, she's just kind of hanging out with him. That apparently yeah. she's been invited for the big day. The big day. That's right. The big game. <laughs> what would you call a party when the Jews are killing their enemies? The slaughter bowl. Wow. Smirks from the tech room, so I win. That's right. <laughs> okay, so they're hanging out for the slaughter bowl. And um, it's a. It, what do you make of this? I would love to know, it, it, for those of you watching at home that are still watching us, what do you make of verses 1 through 19 of chapter 9? Do, do you see a great victory here? a great godly victory over our enemies? Or do you see them taking advantage of a situation in order to kill people, but we're still not going to plunder their goods? What are we supposed to make of all this? I would love to know what y'all think. Uh, while we're letting them let me know. Yes. Uh, we have got some new people that have joined us. Good. Uh, let's see. Shelly and the kids are watching. And Stephanie and Adam are watching. And Margaret and Rufus are watching, and Carolyn Boland's watching, and Jennifer Park says, heart. Well, I'm sure glad to hear from Jennifer, even though we have not seen her this week, yeah. because she has been COVIDing it. So. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed your COVIDcation. Got, got, got lots of rest, uh, caught yeah. up on the, the daytime talk shows, all that <laughs> stuff. Oh, I don't think so. Probably not. No, 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 no. Okay, nobody wants to tell us what they think. <laughs> I'll just tell you what I think. I'm, I'm a little... I don't really know how to take verse, verses 1 through 19. It, it almost, to me, doesn't seem right. Like they've, they've really pushed the envelope just as far as they can, but we're not going to take any of the plunder. Yes. So uh, they were at least that, uh, that righteous, although there's not any obvious textual reason unless it's just to show how much better they are. Right, right. Now, we're, we're, we're not... We're, we're, Protecting ourselves for noble reasons. We're not interested in loot. Right. Verse 16 uh, gives us a little biblical language there. And they got relief from their enemies. Yeah. So the, the land is at rest, except so, they're not in the land. That's right. The land's at rest, except, as you say, they're not in the land. And uh, we do see them to be very powerful. Okay. That brings us then to the end of the chapter. And we have now an annual celebration to remember these two days. It was the 13th in all the country and Susa and the 14th in Susa. Right. So it's celebrated a little different, whether you're rural or urban. But what, what is the celebration that we get in commemoration to this? Uh, it is the Festival of Purim. Okay. Which is still carried out to this day, I believe. It, it is. Uh, I've read before that it's, it's kind of like a Mardi Gras celebration well that sounds kind of appropriate I yeah, guess. yeah maybe that would be more in your 
more liberal Jewish circles and more conservative Jewish circles. There's a reading of Esther, uh, the the twirling of the of the rattles every time Haman's name is mentioned as a way to drown out his name uh, ah. from remembrance. Uh, it, so it, it's it's a big celebration. In light of the fact that there is no mention of God, there's no mention of the law of Moses, the temple of Jerusalem, we, we've said all this stuff before. There's no mention of Passover, which we get the time stamp that we're in the time of Passover. There's no mention of all that. How, do, how are we supposed to take this emphasis that's given to this celebration? Look, look at verses 27 and 28. Um, let's see. Actually, it starts back in verse 26. They called these days Purim after the word Pur Purim. Therefore, because of all that was written in the, in the letter, uh, Mordecai and Esther send a letter that says you've got to remember these days yeah. and how to remember them. Uh, they were in all that they faced and all that happened to them. The Jews, verse 27, firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail... They would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, and city. And that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor shall the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. It, to me, it seems kind of odd, and I'd love to know what y'all think. To me, it seems kind of odd that we have this heavy emphasis given on don't ever forget this celebration, even though we're not going to talk about the, uh, the celebration that God had initiated that occurred at the same time all this was going on. But we don't mention it or God or the law or anything. And the, the, maybe the most interesting part of all of this is why this happens, according to verses 29 through 32. Uh, Queen Esther, daughter of Abihail, along, is that the first time we see his name? Uh, along with Mordecai mm -hmm. the Jew, wrote the second letter with full authority to confirm the letter about Purim. He sent letters with assurances of peace and security to all the Jews who were in the 127 provinces in order to confirm these days of Purim at their proper time, just as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had established them, and just as they had committed themselves and their descendants to the practices of fasting and lamentation. And then verse 32, I think it's the clencher. So Esther's command confirmed these customs of Purim, which were then written into the record. Right. So we have the, the big dog that isn't barking earlier, where we don't see the Jews celebrating Passover. Mm -hmm. But here we have a woman who is the queen of a nation that is not the nation of the Jews, right. who is using her power to sort of, and the machinery of the Persian state, to impose this holiday on all the Jews forever. Right. That uh, this is not like in, in the book of, Exodus, where, where God says, this will be a, a continual statute before you. Mm -hmm. That This is Queen Esther saying, guys, you need to do this forever. Yeah, so in the context of, the, uh, of Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, because she falls into that historical context, they don't make up rules and laws and celebrations. They are constantly forcing people back to the word, back to the law, back to God. Yes. And so it does seem rather odd that we have this celebration that she's pushing, that she initiates, along with Mordecai, that, that says, don't ever forget this, even though the rest of the book, we never talk about God's law or anything at all. It, yeah. it just seems so very odd. And to Carolyn's point just a minute ago, and I, I back up here, I don't know if I but yeah, Esther goes from being a pawn, yeah, yeah, absolutely, to a family. So so she's part of her and Mordecai are joined together in this leader. Uh, she's a family leader. She's a national leader because she she is queen. Yeah, and then she says a religious leader. Yeah, I admit and, I cocked and, kind of an eyebrow there. Well. Here she is instituting a religious festival, as Carolyn says, just right down here at the bottom, celebrating God's deliverance. Or at least an ethnic festival. Or at least an ethnic festival, which, again, it, it, there's a place where there's some oddities. This is one that's really odd to me, 
Because the beginning in chapter four, where, where everybody wants to point out, look how, look how she takes the initiative. Well, she takes the initiative to tell them the fast during Passover. Yeah. And that just seems wrong to, at the it's end of the book. Yeah, it's a puzzler. We're at the end of the book here. Here's this celebration. Don't you ever forget it. <laughs> yes. And you mentioned Ezra and Nehemiah a moment ago. Okay. And it is striking that in the case of both of them, one of the big problems that they're dealing with is the problem of Jews intermarrying with the, yeah. the nations around them. Yeah. Which is exactly what Esther has done, and that's why she's powerful. That's right. Uh, Carolyn, Carolyn says she's a religious leader because she called uh, all the Jews uh, to fast, or at least the Jews in Susa uh, to fast. Although that, that's an interesting so, one. I was, I was, uh, I read the book, Carolyn, and you've already read that. Yeah, it's not very long. I knocked it out in an hour or two. Um, Carolyn, he knocked it out in an hour or two. But uh, I, 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 was, I, can't, I can't see Carolyn's face, but I know she's shaking it like, "Oh my God, you're kidding me!" Uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking about that issue of fasting. And it struck me that there is somebody else uh, who uh, did something similar. And it is, well, I'm not going to tell you where it is, oh. but uh, I, I'm just going to read what God says about this. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll start with verse 27. When somebody heard these words, he tore his clothes, put sackcloth over his body and fasted. He, walked, he lay down in sackcloth and walked around subdued. Then the word of the Lord came to somebody else. Have you seen how he has humbled himself before me? Yep, I know exactly who it is. So, you know, if we're going to say that Esther is some kind of awesome religious leader because she fasted and maybe had some other people fast and got God's favor that way, then we kind of have to apply that same analysis to somebody else who did the same thing. Yeah. And the passage that I just read without names is 1 Kings 21, 27 through 29. Yeah. And the faster is King Ahab. Ahab. That's right. So at most here, we can credit Esther with sort of Ahab yeah. level righteousness, which is not terribly awe inspiring. Okay. All right. We, I, need, I need to turn. We've gotten several, a few comments here. Uh, Kristen Botha said that she finds uh, chapter 8 and verse 15 very interesting. For all of Haman's edging toward the crown, now Mordecai is all decked out in the crown. Yes. So, yes. And, and the funny thing is that all the way through, we've been talking about what a threat to Ahasuerus's mm -hmm. reign Haman is. Mm -hmm. And now it's, even though Haman is no longer there, the right. threat is still there because now the threat is Mordecai. That's right. Uh, Carolyn sends eye roll and your wife says, quit showing off. <laughs> and then, uh, then our old Testament prophet expert, uh, Joshua, look at that. He says in Zechariah seven, the Jews referenced several fasts that they were keeping during the exile. Most were negative. This may be the only one that was positive, And they seem to have done these fast rather than the normal fast. So the, was it four fast that dealt with, or three? I forget. I remember at least two. It was three or four, or I can't see your finger. Say it out loud. That no, the fast. Four. Okay. Yeah, there's four fast to commemorate different. Yeah, like times one of them is the, of the destruction the, of the wall. Yeah. The, the first uh, batch of people going into exile, and so they come and they say, "Hey, look, do we still need to keep doing this?" And then God says, no, actually, I'm going to take those and turn them into festivals for you. And, uh, and so we do have reference to religious holidays other than what's mentioned in the law. Yeah. Uh, so, so Purim is one, the four fasts of Zechariah 7, and then um, Hanukkah. Uh, Hanukkah is, or the Festival of Lights as it's referred to. No, no. Festival of the Dedication. The Dedication. That's, that's how it's referred to in the Gospels. So, you know, we, it's not bad to have these. I don't want to, I didn't want to leave that impression. It's just really odd the language that is used in Esther when we don't see a dedication to these other things. Yes. That we would want to see them, like we do in Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Now, here's a question. I, I want I really would like some 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 feedback on this. To Mordecai and Esther and to the Jews, it was very important for them 
to celebrate God's deliverance. Do you celebrate a deliverance in your life? Is there, is there a moment in your life that you commemorate where you receive some great blessing from God? And I'd like to know, how, how do you do that? Because, man, I, I do wonder, and like I told Matt at the beginning, I'm going to play both sides of this festival coin. <laughs> so this is my positive side. What is the value of having times of remembrance in our lives to remember God's blessings? We, we do that for our birthdays. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we do it, at least I hope we do it for our wedding anniversaries. What's the value of doing those things, not just for significant dates like that, but, but maybe that time that we know God watched out for us over something and we remember it every year? What, what's the value of that? I think it is useful because it brings God to our minds. And you know, my immediate link there is, is not to festivals per se, okay, but to, you know, we sing, O thou fount of every blessing, mm -hmm. here I raise my Ebenezer, hither right. by thy yeah. help I've come. All right, what's the Ebenezer? Uh, the Ebenezer is the stone of help that Samuel set up to commemorate a victory of the Israelites over the Philistines that God was responsible for. Right, right. And basically, they, put, they set up this big rock uh, at the point to which they chased the Philistines. And mm -hmm. so he said, uh, thus far has the Lord helped us. Right, that's right. So, so here is this rock of remembrance. In fact, in the Old Testament, they're always setting up these pillars yes, and are. these rocks of remembrance to remind them, here's what God did for you. So what's the value of us doing something like that today? I think it produces, first of all, humility. Okay. Because it reminds us that we are not like Nebuchadnezzar as he's uh, looking around at Babylon. Is this not this great city which I have built? Mm -hmm. That, that none of us are here because of us. All of us are here because of God. Yeah. yeah. And so it is, it is good to remember that and remember the times when God's hand is especially obvious in our lives. That's right. So I'd like to know, how, how do y'all celebrate and remember times in your life when God has blessed you? Obviously, they felt it was important here, and this is a really big deal. Yeah, well, but not, not, not being exterminated is good. Yeah, not being exterminated is something to celebrate. How do y'all do that? I'll tell you a couple of things that, that go on in, in our family. So years ago, I bought Shelly this little journal, and you were supposed to just write one sentence a day. And I think it had like a three-year cycle in it, mm -hmm. or, or she's taken a few years just to work through it. And sometimes I like to pick that up. She doesn't know this, but she does now. And I... And, and you know, so does everyone else. This is the test to see if she's actually still watching. I like to flip through that and just read the sentence that she wrote. Now, now you'll make me want to snoop your, yeah. your <laughs> Facebook feed there. And, and, and then she just recently learned that her dad does the same thing. He's been doing it for years. <laughs> In a little pocket calendar, he writes down what happened during the day. Each day, he, he writes something down. You know, that, that would be a good practice for us to remember yeah, God's blessings. I can see that. You know, just, just to record things. Because the problem is we, we tend to hold on to the bad stuff and forget the good stuff. That's right. Ingratitude is a terribly common sin. It, it is a very common sin. And you know what? Maybe, maybe for some of the big things, not just birthdays and anniversaries, but maybe some of the big things like a, a you know, a deliverance from, from a, an illness or something like that. Let's write that on the calendar yeah. and let's make a celebration out of that every year as that date rolls around Yeah, and a remembrance to God. Okay, Last, uh, lastly, we get to uh, chapter 10. Matt, what is really odd and unique about chapter 10 other than it's short? Well, uh, I guess this is one of the themes of the book of Esther. It's okay. the stuff that's not mentioned. All right. And here in chapter 10, in addition to it being incredibly short, um, the, among the other things that are not mentioned, mm -hmm. Esther is not mentioned. Esther's she, not she mentioned. She drops out of the narrative. Yeah. So I wrote in, in, in my show notes, all's well that ends well, the saying goes, but does the book of Esther actually end well? Well, first of all, from a vantage point of being one of the main characters, it doesn't end well for her. She's not mentioned. 
What is mentioned, though? Um, Mordecai. All right, Mordecai's mentioned. Uh, let's see, uh, Mordecai is second in rank according to, uh, no, I guess when you go back to verse 2. Uh, he's a powerful man of might and full of honor, high honor. Uh, the king advanced him. Um, and then we kind of kind of a, a familiar line if we were reading 1st, 2nd Kings and 1st, 2nd Chronicles. This is recorded down, you know, right? In the Chronicles. Yeah, although of the, there it's like the Chronicles of Jashar or something. Yeah, that's right. So this is written in the book of the Chronicle of the Kings of Mede and Persia. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus. He was great among the Jews, popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Hey, this, this is a great golden age for the Jews in captivity. So they're really not in captivity. They're free to go back. Yeah, but they, they just like hanging out there. They like hanging out there. And I think it was three or four weeks ago, Josh said, you know, I wonder if, if Mordecai being second in command or second in, in the kingdom, if that didn't make it too good to stay. So then the next book after this is, is Nehemiah and Ezra, and we see them there. Yes. At least on the start of the book. We, we see them there. So... It, you know, there, while there is uh, kind of the uh, a nice thing going on here, a nice situation for the Jews, it might be a detriment to them. Yes. And it is also worth noting that the only thing that we see Ahasuerus doing in the chapter is raising taxes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. There was a tax holiday at the beginning of the book. Now we have an increase of taxes at the end of the book. And uh, they are still there. Um just real quick, uh, Lynn says that the day that you were baptized would be a great thing to celebrate every Absolutely. year. Absolutely. That's right. Makes do you, perfect sense. Do you remember the date that you were baptized? I do not. Lynn, do you remember the date that you were baptized? Uh, I know it was the last Wednesday before Labor Day. No, the last Wednesday of August. But that's that's all I can remember. Eric Nash was leading the singing. I do remember that. Ah. And David Holder was the preacher. Ah. I remember that. But I, the ac actual date, I, I guess I could probably look it up on a calendar. Uh, but that would be good. Uh, Ashley said just a moment ago, something I hadn't realized before. In nine, chapter 9, verse 12, Haman's sons are killed. In chapter 9, verse 13, they are hanged on the gallows. Yes. So they were already dead when they were hanged, maybe to show their victory over Haman's family. Yes. And we discussed, I think, that this may have just been like a big impaling stick. Yeah. So, uh, on the, I, I mean, you might have just had them stacked. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's even more gruesome than just hanging there. Uh, to, to hang a dead body is just desecrating a body. Yeah. Uh, it's, it was not uncommon during the Reformation and times yeah. before to, to exhume a dead body and then burn them at the stake. Although it is also interesting that what Esther asks for in verse 15 was a direct violation of the law. Yeah. Because they weren't supposed to hang people on stuff like That's that. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Actually, we have actually, uh, Lauren, your wife, has one up to you. Yes. She does remember April the 10th, 1991 is when she was baptized. Really? No, you know what? You should, you should have a dinner this year or some celebration. Yeah. Well, it, it would be outside of the, the well, usual... You know, once every two weeks celebrating Lauren stuff. So Yeah, write that down on the calendar and surprise her. Uh, Lynn I'll says, no, I don't remember. But I do remember the date that Jeff and Heather were. So she does redeem herself. That's good. She does redeem herself there. Okay. That kind of wraps up a textual study of the book of Esther. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at apocryphal Esther. Now, this is the embellished account of Esther. Probably not well, and probably, not, probably people don't read it often, at least within our faith tradition. Can yeah. I say it that way? And, um, you know, it's not, it's not in the Bibles that we use, but it is out there and it's very popular. And it's a lot more comfortable than the Esther we actually have. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really neat. So what I'm going to do um, earlier in the week, maybe on Monday, I'll put the show notes out and put a link for Apocryphal Esther, or you can just search for it. It's, you'll find it under Apocryphal Esther or Greek Esther. And, and kind of be uh, 
kind of be reading on that just a little bit. Don't forget your normal day, daily Bible reading. Yes. Uh, but kind of kind of get a familiar handle on apocryphal Esther. It is really different. And so that will be the topic that we study next week. Okay, Matt, give me uh, give me your last word on the book of Esther as a whole. Uh, I, I still stand by my conviction that a lot of these people are just not very pious people. They don't seem to be very godly. And yet God is able to use these not very godly people to accomplish his purpose. Yeah. Uh, which in some ways should be a great comfort even to us. Right. Right. Yeah. I think the big thing I take away from it, and it's actually the subtitle that I gave to God's un unseen hand. God is in the book working at all times. Even though his name's not mentioned, there's no direct references, he's still working. And his people, though they may not be the most pious, at least they're not presented that way. Right. He is still using them to accomplish his purposes. God's purposes are supreme. And uh, to me, that's my, my, my big takeaway from the book. All right. Yep. All right, good deal. All right, who's preaching Sunday? Let's get that in real quick. Well, oh, I, I have the AM done. Yes, you, you have you have all the sermon that's sermoning. That's right. Oh, we have singing. We do. Uh, Sunday night singing. Uh, the AM sermon is going to be uh, Let There Be Light, Righteousness Over Wickedness. Is that how I titled it? <laughs> I don't remember. I only paid attention to what I was supposed to preach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Righteousness Over Wickedness, I think. Uh, along those lines. Along those lines, yeah. I actually, I actually pulled out. I, saw, I, I did all this three weeks ago when I wrote the sermon outlines yes. and all that. And, and then you sent me the outline that I ignored. And then I said, well, you referenced some of it. And uh, so I pulled it out last night to read it, and I've never forgotten what I had titled it. <laughs> but that's the idea, the light uh, over darkness, righteousness over wickedness. And uh, that will be what we'll be looking at Sunday morning, 1015. If you're watching us out there and you're not a member of the Jackson Heights Church of Christ, but you live in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we would love to have you visit yeah. with us. We'd love to meet you. Yeah, we're live and in person at 1015 yes, we're, we're on Sunday mornings and five o'clock on Sunday evenings. Uh, or you can join us uh, via live stream if you don't live in the area and at those times as well. Yeah, you've already figured out how to do that. That's right. Thank you very much. God bless you. Be safe. And... Hopefully we'll be back very soon. Yes, indeed.